Hi, good afternoon there. I'm Sean Casey with Doodle Labs. I'm an application engineer. And today we're gonna to start a video series about the Graphic User Interface Quick Walkthrough Guide. The GUI Quick Walkthrough Guide for basic settings goes over the following key features and parameters. One, connecting device to radio IP. Two, accessing GUI by IP and web browser. Three, first time GUI login. Four, status overview, which can be found in the basic settings and then status tab. Five, mesh map, which again can be found in the basic settings and then status tab. Six, simple configuration, which can be found in basic settings and then the simple configuration tab. And also of note, the general profile, the UAV or unmanned aerial vehicle profile, the GCS or ground control station profile, and then seven would be the admin password, which can be found in the basic settings and then admin tab. So the first thing we'll do is show you how to connect your radio to the IP address of your computer. This can be done by going to your Wi-Fi settings. In Windows 11, I'll show you how this works. This will be different for an operating system such as Apple, iOS, or for uh, Linux OS as well. We're gonna go to more Wi-Fi settings, network and internet, and then ethernet. Under ethernet, we're gonna configure IP. The IP of my radio is 10.223.93.121. This will become the gateway IP for your laptop or computer. The subnet mask is 255.255.0.0. In some operating systems, you might simply just enter 16. The IP address of my computer will be 10.223.93.120 or any IP address within the subnet of 255.0.0. A preferred DNS is a domain name server 8.8.8.8 .8 .8 is generic if requested and then just simply hit save. After this point, simply just type in the IP address of the radio into any browser of your choosing. We tend to prefer Chrome because it has the best overall performance. As you can see, I typed in the IP address in my browser header. Now, as our graphic user interface loads, you'll notice that your rendering time is actually dependent on your browser and might take longer on some browsers compared to the others. So to start with, this is our Mesh Writer graphic user interface or GUI splash page. By default, we have our username of root and a password that's blank. You can configure these two things to whatever you would like for a password and username, but most people tend to leave the password blank to have an easy and seamless experience to log in and debug quickly. So now we'll just click login. Now we start on the status overview page. The system will have some necessary information for model tracking and name clarification of the model. The host name will be Doodle Smart Radio 301A505D79. The model variant is the MB2025-2KMXW submodel rm 1675 2km xw or our wearable OEM. Our firmware version is located here and is a September 04 release of 2023. It will also show you things like local time, uptime, and average load. Now on all Doodle Labs radios, there will be two primary Ethernet interfaces, Ethernet 0 and Ethernet 1. Currently, we have the Ethernet uh, 0 in the down state and Ethernet 1 is up, but not available in a speed mode. The MAC addresses of both are unique and are listed right here below. So here we can see our current status of our wireless network. By default, we have a mesh rider radio configured in a successful mesh. In the background, I have an additional radio operating currently. Now these are both operating on channel 51, which is 1.675 gigahertz, and at a bitrate of 58.5 megabits per second with a standard encryption of WPA3 SAE CCMP, which is standard by default in our radios. Our associated stations are our other radios connected. So by default, that's this MAC address right here. And because we have not declared a host, it is an unknown status. Our signal is negative 30 dBm and our noise is negative 94 dBm. And again, we can see our megabit per second transfer rate at a total of 29.3 megabits per second at 10 megahertz for bandwidth at an MCS of six. 
Now, if we go to mesh map, we do not actually have mesh map configured on both radios. By default, it is highly suggested to not run these unless you're doing a significant debug as they take up more overhead and actual CPU performance on our radios. Now we'll go to the simple configuration, which is the bread and butter of how our radios easily connect in mesh configuration. We'll give that a second to load. So here we have our simple configuration and we can see our profile configuration right here. So for the first time configuration, choose your profile and options below. So what we're getting at is that we would like you to start off with just a simple configuration before you learn more advanced settings that might be difficult to understand. Now by default, our general profile is what's first recommended. We also have a UAV profile and a GCS profile, which we'll walk through in a couple of seconds. So by default, our wireless configuration for our primary radio has an active frequency band of 1.675 gigahertz, and we have a couple of scenario options. By default, we recommend mesh on radio zero as our default way moving forward for a first time setup. But we also have several other configurations such as WDS access point on radio zero, gateway with WDS access point, WDS client on radio zero, gateway with mesh, mesh multi-radio, and dynamic mesh. So our mesh ID by default is simple config. Our wireless password by default is just doodle smart radio. Our channel on this particular model is channel 51 or 1.675 megahertz. As you can see, we have a, a, quite a number of options for this particular variant. And you can see also this is a helix model, which means it has the M1 through M6 government bands, which is 1.675 gigahertz to 2.45 gigahertz. Now, if we go down here to bandwidth, we can see by default, we highly recommend you do 10 megahertz. This would also be for 915 and 2.4 radios, as this is away from common Wi-Fi interference. Uh, and a couple of notes on um, bandwidth can be found in our technical library under the RX sensitivity and channel bandwidth guide. Now in general, reducing the channel bandwidth affords you more range and better resilience to constant uh, co-channel interference. This would be particular to 2.4 and 5.8 Wi-Fi interference, but this does come at the, the cost of reduced bandwidth and poor resilience to interme uh, intermediate interference. So we can see in our kind of crude models down here, we have a narrow bandwidth. And so we're, we're attempting to talk over this noise. The power of each data symbol is integrated over a longer duration, and this smooths out the noise. Now with a wide bandwidth, we are able to get in between the intermediate interference, but the integration time for each data symbol is shorter. So we are more susceptible to constant background noise. Now a really interesting tool we've come up with is called the throughput estimation calculator. Now we'll, we'll plug in our actual features for our actual model we have here. We have a 1.675 gigahertz radio and we have a 10, mega, uh, 10 megahertz bandwidth right here. So now if we go in and plug in our values, we'll see how we can modify and play with um, the actual features of bandwidth and get real time results. So we have an actual 10 megahertz channel bandwidth and we have 1675 uh, megahertz uh, actual primary frequency. So now we'll analyze that. What this is showing us is that by default, at a close range of about 400 meters, we should have an actual throughput of around 45 megabits per second. Now, this will also show stuff like the Fresnel zone clearance and the expected range of approximately 6 kilometers. Now, we can also go to the wearable to make our system a little bit more accurate here and see if that changes the results. As you can see, not too much, but we do see some slight number changes from model to model. Now, as a curiosity, let's see what if we do a maximum bandwidth at 40 megahertz and see how this affects our data. Now we have a much higher throughput at around 140 megabits per second, but if we extrapolate that to around 400 meters where the previous graph starts, that's still around 130. We have an expected range of around three kilometers. Now, conversely, what happens if we put the megahertz bandwidth to three and we have the shortest or narrowest bandwidth possible? Let's analyze those results. So now we see a maximum throughput estimation of around 14 megabits per second, but an expected range of around 1100 uh, kilom or excuse me, meters, uh, excuse me, 11,000 meters, which is 11 kilometers. Now going back to the simple configuration page, we were currently at bandwidth. We're going to make an application note on operating distance. By default, this is 4,000 meters. A common misconception is that operating distance is uh, actually proportional to TX power or transmit power or increasing the range by increasing power. Uh, with the actual waveform of a radio, 
This is an actual optimization for latency. As we know, a radio wave is a waveform and is affected by distance. When we change this number, it's optimizing the expected latency at 4,000 meters. At 10,000 meters, it is also estimating the latency at 10,000 meters. In 1,000 meters, again, it will estimate that latency to be shorter. Now, by default, we have a number of device setting which optimizes for one to two nodes. You can also do three to five, six to 10, or more than 10. We also have a, a default actual pre-select for optimize for latency. Now, if we go to our technical library and we look at latency throughput and robustness optimization in our technical lib, we have the optimize for latency over throughput and it does what the name implies. It results in improved latency, but the maximum achievable throughput is generally reduced by about half for higher MCS rates. Now we're gonna look at our configuration for the Wi-Fi radio, which is indep independent of the primary radio interface at 1.675 uh, gigahertz. We only have one scenario selection for our Wi-Fi radio, a default SSID or name, which you can modify to whatever you might like. And we have a wireless password, which is again by default, Doodle Smart Radio. By default, this is on channel 36 or 5.18 gigahertz. We do have options for other configurations on 2.4 and 5.18 as well. And now we'll look at the network configuration. By default, Ethernet 1 is ad added to Bridge WAN or Bridge Wide Area Network. We call this BR WAN for the shorthand. Additional static IPs you can include on this too, as well as NetMask. The DHCP on BR WAN by default is client. It is important to note there's three options, disabled, server, and client. Now two clients can, can successfully connect in the mesh as well as a server and a client. However, two servers cannot successfully connect to each other. By default, enable automatic command and control queue detection is available. More documentation can be found in traffic prioritization and link optimization about what these kind of optimizations for queues might do in your settings, but that's more reserved for the advanced uh, graphic user interface walkthrough guide. Now we can look at the rate threshold, which is by default 400 kilobits per second, which is a size threshold of 400 bytes. By default, we will not have this secondary feature available right here, so we'll remove that as I was messing with my own settings. Now by default, we have a port assignment on 14550, which is common for Mavlink or QGround control or a number of UAS applications. This is our primary command and control uh, interface, which is equivalent to a CS6 prioritization. What we can also do, which was previously uh, shown, is add a secondary port to say break out a live stream to have its own independent port and less interference from the common port at 14550. You can set this port to whatever you like. And to change this, you could hit video right here or CS5. Best effort and background are two other optimizations, but for the most part, we recommend only splitting out a live stream to CS5 or the actual command and control backup queue. Now to save and apply, this is important to note, this will make a permanent change to the settings, whereas save will not, and reset will change all of the simple configuration settings to their default settings. So now we'll hit save and apply, and we'll give it a couple of minutes to load. Now by default, the simple config page will take about one minute to save all the settings change, just because it has multiple independent settings linked to this uh, primary page. To save us both the time, I will pause it here and let it load. Now we're gonna go back to our simple configuration page and look at our other available profiles. By default, we are looking at our general profile, but we also have a UAV or unmanned aerial vehicle profile, as well as a GCS or ground control station profile. For the UAV profile, we're only gonna highlight the differences between this and the simple configuration and highlight the key actual application specific features. So by default, we have the enable GCS or ground control station finder, which is uh, advertising the IP address of the drone. This will make the drone more discoverable to the ground control station and broadcast this IP address. By default, we have a baud rate of 57,600, which is common in most PX4 or Mavlink vehicles. This can be configured to whatever you like, but an important application note is that at baud rates over 500,000, we're gonna to have to be model specific with our radios as the Nano, Mini, and Type 2J and wearable all have different baud rate limitations, whereas the Type 2J has a baud rate over a million as a configurable option. So if you have a very high baud rate over 500,000, you might wanna actually look at our legacy models or model specific features, which can be found in our technical library under products. So here we have a central configuration guide 
right here where we have enable central config selection, which we do not recommend to select by default, and a primary node assignment. It's important to note that primary node is essentially a server or client relationship. By default on a UAV profile, we most likely want to make it a primary node. If we were a client, this would point to the server side. So we most likely want to have a client mode enabled on the ground control station and a server enabled on the UAV. With enable central ACS or automatic channel selection, it's very important to note this is only for one-to-one -one relationships. Whereas if you have a UAV or multiple UAVs rather connected to a ground control station or more than one, you do not want to enable central ACS by default. This is only optimized for one drone and one ground control station. Everything else in wireless configuration and the actual Wi-Fi radio is identical. We can see below, we have a primary port again for our telemetry at port 14550. And for our live stream video or BDL, we have a port of 2000. Now, if we go back up to the GCS profile, we'll see it's very similar to the UAV or unmanned aerial vehicle profile, whereas we do not have the GCS advertiser as we are the GCS in this scenario. So again, if we more than likely want the UAV to be the primary node, we would then put in the primary node IP address or basically putting in the IP address of the UAV radio right here. Everything else is very similar and identical to the profile setups we've discussed before. Our only other tab available in our basic uh, GUI for the wearable OEM is the admin and admin password page. Here is where you can set your password and confirm your password, which was again your original login when you had uh, uh, the password and user. By default, it's root with no password. This is not something that's necessarily required. And by default, most customers do not configure this to make easy setup and uh, IP logging to get into their radios. Now, a really interesting thing to see too would be to see our actual overview again. and look again at our signal and noise. It's important to note that in our GUI, these will change real time and that these values are environmental and not constant. The refresh on these is usually less than a second uh, determinable by your latency. And by default, again, we're now at negative 34 dBm and negative 94 noise. I hope this was helpful in the basic uh, graphic user interface walkthrough for the wearable OEM.